Welcome to the latest series of The Fodcast, where we bring you the latest insights into the future of digital commerce. In season six, we continue to interview some of the most respected professionals in the industry as we broaden the topics to cover what it takes to build a business within e-commerce, navigating through business change, as well as the future of technology within digital commerce. As we continue our journey to have one of the best podcasts within commerce, we ask you to like and share within your network if you enjoy our content. Hello, and welcome back to the podcast. It's actually been a while since my last recording, so let's hope I'm not too rusty today. Today, I'd like to welcome Simon Suarez, Director of Enterprise Architecture at Absolute Labs. Welcome, Simon. Hi, thanks. Thanks for joining me. Prior to Absolute Labs, uh, Simon spent a number of years in retail, holding senior architecture positions for brands such as Kering, Stella McCartney, and Sweaty Betty, amongst others. Today, we will be focusing on the future of technology within digital commerce. But before we start, Simon, do you want to give a slightly more detailed summary of your experience? Sure. Um, As you say, I I spent most of my career working directly with retailers. So um, I spent around 12 years, uh, 12 to 13 years in luxury goods, holding pretty much most of the the jobs across the IT team from from development, project management, BA, all the way up to when I left Stella McCartney as the head of architecture. I moved on to to Sweaty Betty, where I uh, I was their enterprise architect for the best part of of two years, uh, and then since then I've moved on and I'm I'm now working uh, for a retail consultancy and we uh, we specialize uh, mainly in retail, um, but uh, uh, primarily in omni-channel and digital transformation. Nice. And how long is it you've been with Absolute Labs for now? Since uh, since April the first. Yeah. Awesome. Awesome. So someone that's certainly well placed then to talk through the future of technology, sorry, within digital commerce, uh, given your background. So I think um, let, let's get started and uh, let, let's see where it goes. So I, I, I felt it would be really good to start the conversation today with with um, how technology has um, has progressed, how it's evolved and looking at maybe what the uh, the old normal was versus what is the new normal. Yeah, sure. Um I mean, I, I'm speaking from from experience working across uh, and with multiple departments uh, in the past. Previously, there was a lot of disconnected thinking. So uh, you would you would have a lot of departments working in silos. So physical retail, digital marketing as the main culprits um, tend to be running their own individual projects, whereas, um, you know, in in the new omni world everyone has to work together towards the same goal because a lot of the technologies that have been introduced to sort of they are they span um multiple areas of the business um everything now is more more customer centric uh rather than just focusing on individual touch points so it, it's sort of natural that um that any of that connective thinking is 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 as i said cross department and cross functional um, yeah um, Okay. And what do you feel um, was the key turning point in, in driving that change uh, uh, for the I businesses think, to speak uh, collaboratively, basically? I, I think it was as the, as, as sort of the, um, the, the emphasis was more on, on the customer and omni-channel journeys. It's just a natural progression because you can't work in a silo when you're trying to answer a customer need rather than a touch point need. So if we think of a customer journey all the way through from say visiting the site, browsing products, going into store, purchasing, potentially purchasing something that's gonna be shipped to them and then receiving it and going through after sales, that's a journey that can't be realized by one singular department and piece of tech. It has to be um, it has to be connected thinking across the board, otherwise it just doesn't work. And as a customer, you notice that the tech is disconnected because your experience is disconnected. Yeah, it's uh, it, one company who do really well is is John Lewis, where they have that sort of kitchen sink mentality, where if I go into store and then I go online, I can see that that in store purchase online and i can reach out for after sales advice and support directly from the web you know if those two uh, channels didn't work together in unison i just wouldn't be feasible yeah it's certainly something that we have seen some uh, some brands uh, really develop their offerings on over the last sort of uh, four or five years mm-hmm. and as a customer you you definitely 
yeah, you definitely feel it when a company has their te technology in sync, because like you said, you just get a better experience. Um, you mentioned John Lewis are uh, are one of the leaders uh, in this space. W what other brands, in your in your opinion, are are leading the way here? Um, it tends to be the fast fashion brands that do do incredibly well at connecting the journeys together. The one thing that that you would expect is that it would be luxury picking up that mantle. But to be honest, from from my experience, they're a little bit behind the the curb. Um, COVID except accelerated a lot of that uh, because every single business suddenly had to be um, their own sort of omni fulfillment center. So they were sorry, every single store rather. So um, we I had instances where we were working with retailers and they said, look, as soon as COVID hit, we we were a, a retail heavy business, a physical retail heavy business. And we need to start it, we need to start um, turning those stores into physical uh, warehouses and, and fulfillment centers. I think uh, with all the, the bad it did, COVID did accelerate that omni thinking. Okay. Okay. So, um, yeah, well, I guess when you have events like, like COVID as example, I mean, it forces businesses to, to think outside the box and to, to, to make the changes to, to potentially uh, future proof or modernize or uh, evolve with, with uh, the, the ever changing times. Right. So, so yeah. that makes sense. So look, if we could look at um, the, the technology and its uh, evolution over that kind of period of time, um, it's, it's safe to say that we can do, hell of a lot more now than we could 10 years ago but what does that mean for decision makers that maybe sit within retail how how has uh, kind of their roles changed um i mean it, it's the inverse of what i was talking about in terms of old normal nor, new normal they they now have to have this uh singular program of work um which which carry you know if you're working directly in a retailer is a continuous improvement program where uh, there is a roadmap, which each particular channel and each, uh, each department feeds into. Um, it has to be very joined up in the way that things happen, the order of projects. Um, it's no long. I mean, that whole siloed working where, where you say the marketing team never spoke to the digital team, for instance, which is something I saw quite, quite often that just doesn't happen anymore. Um, so I I quite like the change that 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 this sort of joined up omni thinking has has brought about. Okay, and does does that require like a different type of decision maker then to come into a business? If if you let's say for example you've been a, a C suite within a retail brand for. 15 20 years and this mm. change has, has come around in the last kind of 10 years as a business to talk to each other in your opinion how easily can that then that existing c-suite uh, adapts to what is now required from a c-suite it, it it's it's meant that i think the the ceo and the and the, the ceo have to make the the probably wider choices across the business um and then we've seen at least from a from a hiring perspective that those sort of growth leads and head of growth roles have been put in place to be able to connect the operational side of the business, the tech side of the business, and advise the CEO and COO in terms of what needs to happen next. Okay. So it's been a sort of a de-evolution of power when we're thinking of CMO, CTO. But uh, it's I, I think there is the 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 sort of the, the the chief execs are getting a little bit more involved in that project decision um uh, uh space now because there has to be something which is is looking across the entire business rather than each individual um pillar but yeah okay you, you touched upon something interesting there and it was the um the head of growth higher yeah. becoming something that's slightly more common now and i mean i must admit five years ago I rarely saw head of growth online and now you see them in a lot in a lot of businesses are yeah. there any other hires that you feel have become um like crucial to to brands to make when uh, going through these transformation programs and what have you yeah um i mean when we think of transformation programs they if if it's a if it's a set transformation there's there's the onboarding of consultants and 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 set teams to manage it but if we're just thinking of organic managing organic growth over a long period of time there's a lot of bas who are now becoming more aligned to product mm. so 
previously product product management was something mainly in a in a company who are producing say a system or a piece of tech retailers now have their own product led development um which i think is is helping to 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 for that joined up thinking to happen because you've got um sort of business uh business analysts who are who are product led on the tech team who are partnering with the various departments across the uh, across the retailer and bring everything together so i think the the rise of sort of product ownership within a retail business especially from a tech perspective that that's something that i've seen over the last five years um you know change considerably besides the head of growth position which is a little bit higher up and think strategically they're more mm. uh techno functional so they understand the tech enough to be able to advise but then they also have a deep understanding of the business and the pillars for growth you know for the next three four five years so they know where to get they they know where they want to get to the product owners ha, are sort of more on the ground and understand um what changes need to be made at, at a lower level in the business to make that happen and then between tech teams digital marketing customer service etc everyone joins together to make it a reality yeah i know there's a, a lot of a lot of uh businesses have undergone the the project to, to product uh sort mm-hmm. of mentality switch over that period of time and i mean there's still many that are going through that journey now um uh, it, it makes sense both on on what you've just said and how it it forces that collaborativeness yeah, yeah that's the word right collaborativeness <laughs> <laughs> Finally, um, that, yeah that's it right um so okay and and uh, we know retail itself is is well in my opinion it's a fairly forward thinking industry it's very much mm-hmm. led by the um the customers demands and and i mean they're, they're changing all the time right in in your opinion how are the, the capabilities of the current technology stacks available to retail um how do they sit versus um like customer expectations are they uh, are they are they able to do what they need to do right now or we're we going to see further evolution i think customer expectations is a funny one and i think we spoke about this before um they we i i think the industry is about to be shocked because there is this generation who are coming up who who live in 10 second bursts and they are watching tiktok and instagram reels and things like that mm. you have less time to make an impression on somebody now than you used to because we take in micro bits of information people watch the news on tiktok now rather than sit down and watch a um you know 30 minute bulletin uh so I mean, it's um, I think that's going to change the way we work. We or not the tech can live up to the expectations. It definitely can, but we I feel like we're always slightly behind the curve. So uh, you have to set yourself up to be agile and to be able to change things quickly because what works today might not work necessarily next year. Mm. So it's more putting in the. Um, the fundamentals and the foundations within your your organization to make sure that you can very quickly change and adapt to what happens with the consumer and i think there is this generational shift which is about to happen where maybe they are people are less patient and they need that that instant hit to be able to 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 you know to make a difference i think okay okay uh, i know i know um we, we're seeing it with with a lot of marketing as well is you have that really short window and mm. maybe even less than 10 seconds to get someone's attention if you were if you were a, a brand um what would be the what, what, what's the number one thing you would encourage your clients to do to maximize that kind of 10 second window to engage with their customers we're seeing a lot i think around clienteling people clienteling is a funny one clienteling used to be very much luxury driven so there was a wealth of information held against a client. So when you came into a store, a sales associate could deal with them like they knew them. Mm. Because of, and and we go, we always go slightly back to COVID, but it was such a massive effect on the world's economy. A lot of the customers who were previously buying in those sort of mid-tier luxury, high and luxury shops are now are now going a little bit lower and looking at the more high quality fast fashion markets. They expect the same sort of customer service that they used to. And one thing that I always look at from clienteling is because we're all mobile driven now in stores, it's a big detractor to walk into a store and have a sales associate looking at their phone all the time. You go, you think, are they actually talking to me or are they just staring at an app? 
So being able to learn as much as you can about a customer who walks into a store within a very small amount of time and be able mm -hmm. to make a meaningful impact in that conversation, I think is going to be really, really valuable going forward, mainly because the the customers that you wouldn't normally expect walking into that sort of mid-tier, high-end, fast fashion, let's call it your M&S, they yeah. expect the same sort of service that they were getting when they were walking into a more luxury retailer. Okay. Is, but, is there for the kids? There... I don't know what you'll do. The the ten second attention span I see with my own kids. So I mean, yeah. I don't know what we'll do going forwards with that. But if you work it out, you have to let me know. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> All right. Well, I'm not sure I've any hope of doing that anytime soon. But uh, yeah, let, let, let's see. You never know what's around the corner, right? Eh? Yeah. I do. I do. Um, I, I, the point you mentioned about the the, the brands like M and S picking up some of that market share and what have you is quite interesting mm -hmm. i often look at it when i go shopping and when you uh speak to a store assistant or what have you I, I, I find it a really hard job because like personally i like to just go into a store and just look around and to keep myself to myself but then i know there's other people that obviously really like to have um a guide and okay where do you keep this item and what about this and where's your new arrivals and, and all that kind of stuff um and i think if a brand can somehow unlock knowing the customer and how they want to be approached and that would be awesome mm. for them but i mean is that is that possible how without sort of any kind of facial recognition as someone walks into the store with then a list of points about that customer and how they like to be dealt with from previous interactions is that possible i don't know yeah tying into a loyalty scheme i think works and making that interaction really really quick um we work with foot asylum and one of the things that they did to enable their loyalty scheme was if you walk into the store, you don't have to tell the person who you are. Um, if you have the app, you ask them to scan the QR code, they instantly know who you are. So okay. they, they're they actually a really good example of a retailer who goes beyond the selling ceremony and they have a lot of things that they tap into, social and uh, gamification and things like that, which go beyond what... Um, uh, you would normally expect of a retailer. I think they had like a Big Brother type YouTube um, series kind of earlier in the year. Like it, it's things like that which which are differentiating them and uh, and and sort of plugging them into that TikTok generation as well. Okay, it's something that they do very very well. But yeah, the the working out who somebody is um is is fairly difficult in the past we've experimented um at, at luxury with things like beacons and apps um and it's there's a there's a very um fine line between uh helpful and creepy yeah and you've got to be careful that you don't cross from one side to the other so there's there's both sides there's there's making sure that if you are going to use something like an app on a phone and you've got sort of you've remove cues because you're running around the store with an MPOS. You have to be very careful that you don't upset the client because you're staring at a phone because the, co the conversation and the attention has to be on them. But on the other side, if you try to go without a device and do some things like, like beacons and, and, uh, um, and, and the like, it becomes a little bit creepy, which is just as bad because at the moment there is also the emphasis on, on sharing data. If you go every single app you install on an iPhone, as soon as you turn it on, it tells you what data it wants to share and you can restrict any of it. So people are now more conscious about the data that they're sharing with people. And it is a harder push to get consent for marketing or to store custom, to, to even ask people for their information. So whereas the technology is getting better, I think the, the, the emphasis on privacy and, um, and this sort of 10 second window to make an impression is, is going to make it interesting to see how people utilize that technology in the future. Yeah. And um, I guess a lot of that also goes that then back down to the brand and how, how their staff are and how their staff uh, engage with customers from a personal experience as well. So when you're, you're doing that, because if you have a trusted relationship with a, with a brand, then you'll be more likely in the future to, to do what they would like you to do and whereas if you go into a store and you don't have a great experience then you're probably going to be less likely to maybe download the app or to give them your consent and etc so regardless of technology like you said it's going back down to that personal interaction between brand and um, customer um, it's quite interesting yeah, the bad experiences hit you harder than the good ones 
if you always. think about reviews for products, the ones that that will always stick out, the bad reviews. There are there's very limited people who have the time to go onto Amazon or 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 anywhere and say how much that product changed their life. Whereas the ones which are bad, they will make the effort and the time to do that to to feedback. And one thing that we saw when GDPR kicked off is all of a sudden everybody knew about right to rem for removal, <laughs> and subject access requests, and you would get calls. Um, we 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 had them quite a bit when I was I was working at Karen. We had calls where they would say, "Can you please remove my data?" On the presumption that we had some, and we would go searching for this email address, and it didn't exist. But they had read about it, and in their mind, they wanted it removed. So even back, you know, we're talking five years ago, the, the this whole move to 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 be, you know, for privacy, um, it started then, and you know, we countless data breaches since then. It's going to get worse. Um, so being able to handle that trust in terms of being able to pro to provide a, a safe way or a safe medium for for data to be captured and used, I think, is massive. Uh, yeah, yeah. I mean, I think all businesses suffering from, uh, maybe not suffering, all the all the business are feeling the effects of the GDPR uh, piece. And uh, I mean, I, I still wonder if it if it really works. I hit unsubscribe on emails every day. Yet the next day, I still manage to get another one from the same brand. So, uh, but there we go. Fortunately, I, I don't mind too much. But I know there's people out there that do have big problems with this. Um, but let, let, going going back to sort of the technology itself, then, and uh, of how it's evolved. I mean, what would you say? Um, is the single piece of technology at the minute that is driving the most amount of change the the one that we see the most demand for is around is around loyalty and okay. uh automating promotions between channels um the, to be able to offer the the same discounts the same loyalty rewards uh, across your digital and your physical retail channels and and to do it in a way that's easily managed so we've done a lot of work with talent one recently um there are um, mac alliance SaaS based application which allows you to centralize discounts centralize loyalty there's a massive demand for it um and you'll excuse me for going back to covid a bit but as COVID dropped off and people after retailers had, had introduced these um, these lovely ways to to turn stores into fulfillment centers, there was this big drive for omnichannel. OMS was like top of everyone's mind. I need an OMS. I need uh, a unified commerce till which will allow me to do picks in store. I want to be able to offer my clients uh, endless R and all sorts of stuff. Then um, marketing. So everyone was looking towards CDP, CDXP, you know, my marketing tech of old where I was just sending out general newsletters doesn't work anymore. Um, I need to drive this new online traffic that I inherited over COVID because everyone suddenly started buying things online. You know, at Sweaty Betty, they did extremely well over COVID because lots of people bought leggings because they were at home. Mm. How do I drive that online presence back into store now my stores are open? which is you know marketing now that's all been refined and when you know we're in this this state of fragility where there are economic issues people don't have as much money how do i keep that customer how do i make them loyal and how do i keep them coming back by offering them tailored promotions so they feel special because that's another sort of know your customer clienteling type activity it's i don't need to know everything about my customer on a page but if i can provide a promotion a deal uh, a bit of gamification which which makes that customer feel like i thought about them that's special because we 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 are more cost conscious and there are there's a rise in things like sheen where people will sacrifice the the um their need for for uh, uh, uh for quality goods even and as long as they can get something quick fast and cheap that that's an that's a uh, an offering that they want to take now which i don't think they did before yeah i i think the the, the loyalty piece is something that we're seeing a lot of at the minute and it's always been an area that i felt could be improved within retail and the amount of times you get emails that it's just clear that it's gone to everybody that signed up 25 percent off for the next two hours or until midnight tomorrow 15 percent off 
um, which is great as a, a getting discount. But I always wondered what impact that would have to the to the brand because I know I won't mention their name, but there was a, there's a really big online uh, fashion retailer um, that every month would send me a discount of somewhere between fifteen and twenty percent. So unless I really really needed an item, I would just wait until I got that discount code, yeah. and then I'd buy it then. Um, because I knew it would come within two or three weeks of when I wanted something. So they were missing out on revenue from me, albeit only me, but I'm sure I'm not the only one that was uh, that picked up on the fact that this code came every month. Yeah. And behind the scenes, it's it's causing real damage to those retailers as well. Um, they're cutting margins. Uh, it's very difficult for them to control those promotional costs that, that, that they're, in, they're accruing. Um, and, and again, it does lose... It loses a little bit of uh, personalization with the client. If you see a cus if you see a retailer who is just giving blanket discounts, you perceive them as not doing very well. Mm. That you know there is nothing. Uh, it's almost a rat race to be able to get those discounts. Whereas if you are say you are sent uh, a pre-sale code because you're a valued client, that's a slightly different proposition. It's there is a sale, but I'm being given access first. And then behind the scenes, it's I'm worried about how for for the retail, I'm worried about how many promotions I'm giving. So by introducing this sort of best of breed tool, I'll be able to budget them and make sure that I'm not over promoting. I'm not I'm not, uh, you know, after the discount has reached a certain level, I'm going to automatically cut it down or I'm going to lower it and change that discount automatically on site so that I protect my bottom line as well. Oh, yeah, yeah. I guess then that's, uh, I guess, a good example of how technology has evolved over over time. Because I'd imagine some of that stuff wasn't possible ten years ago, maybe even five years ago. Um, possible and possible per channel. I would say okay. there were tools that could do it, you know, just for your digital channel or just for your retail channel. That connected thinking between the two wasn't a th it wasn't available. Um, you know, it's that's that's one thing this new Mac composable view has given us is that you can take lots of different applications, uh, join them together, tightly coupled with with decent integration and, and data flows and, and produce something which is slightly a different offering to something another retailer provides. So people, are, there are companies who are differentiating themselves based on the tech that they choose now, opposed to just the their product. Yeah. OK. Um something you spoke about um, at the start of this was gamification and mm. it's, it, com it comes up in a few of my conversations. And to be honest with you, I, I, I never really noticed it as a, as a customer, but it's something that's being spoken about a lot. And I know there's some good examples of, um, of brands that are doing gamification with their customers and having success. Like, in your opinion, what, um, what do you think makes the gamification approach work? It, it, I mean, it works for the retailer because it it pushes a client to 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 come back and transact again. Um, the sort of hospitality industry, hotel industry, has done really well with that over the years. If you go onto Booking dot com, you know, you 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 book ten ten uh, nights, you get an extra night free. It's that sort of repeat service gamification. Um, coffee shops do it really well. Costa does it amazingly well. Um, I wouldn't say it's my favorite brand of coffee, but I do go back there because I know that after I have a certain amount of coffees, I will get my free coffee, which feels like a win, even though I've had to buy, you know, 30, 40 pounds worth of coffee to get to that. I get it, yeah. Um, but it, it's very, it's very sort of, uh, I don't know, it's, it's in our psyche to look at things like that, like look at um, badges and, and, and feel rewarded like we're doing something right um gamification again is it's one of those things where i think it needs to be done lightly um you can sort of cheapen the brand if you do it a little bit too much um we've seen quite a few retailers taking that that approach where uh they don't even tell you that that you're part of the the uh, gamification program they just tell you when you've been rewarded so I've you have made 10 transactions with us in the last three months. So we're giving you a 5% off voucher. That's even more powerful than a customer working towards it because it's something they didn't expect. Mm. And I think you get more loyalty from providing 
uh, promotions and, and, and loyalty rewards and gamification rewards for things that they weren't expecting. Unless yeah. you're in the coffee industry. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's always nice to, to, to receive something unexpected, like you said. So I can see, I can see why, why that would be. Yeah. I guess I would, I guess on, on the flip side, if I knew that I had something coming, then I might try harder to get it, i.e. maybe make another transaction sooner or spend a bit more money in my last transaction or whatever. But yeah. I guess I mean, every customer is slightly different and approach these things in different ways. And there's never going to be a one size fits all approach, right? But that, those, the, these new promotions engines, they, they're very powerful in telling you what you, what discounts and promotions you've been awarded, but also the ones that you've missed out on. So, they will tell you uh, if you add free items to the basket, it's automatically going to put a promotion for, for say, 10% off across the basket. But if you're missing one of the products which makes up that bundle, they're smart enough to be able to push a, a message back to you via the website or to say even the sales associate on the till to say, oh, by the way, if you add this one more item, you will save four pounds or you will save six pounds, et cetera. So the, they are they're very good at, at both sides of the coin as well. Um, so I, I think that's going to be an interesting one. I'm seeing a lot of demand. Um, the big change, of course, with stuff like that is there's more of a drive to be online. And even now in 2024, if you speak to a tech team and you say, your till in the store always has to be online. They say, no, 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 no. There is a there is a, a, a one day of the year when suddenly the network goes down and we cannot manage that. But do you do you build something nice for the business on the 99.9% or do you tailor to the 0.1%? Uh, we have a we were speaking to um to a prospect um where they were planning on having this always on, uh, always online digital promotions engine um, on their boats that are currently off the coast of Antarctica and they're linked um, with satellite internet. And for them, it wasn't a big deal for potentially them not being able to provide a loyalty promotion if the satellite went down. Whereas I've spoken to retailers who have stores on Bond Street who say, yeah, but the internet's a bit spotty. And it's when you 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 bring that comparison in, mm. you think, is is it that big a deal that you have to disappoint the one in a thousand customers if you can provide something really engaging and and uh, and powerful to the other uh, nine hundred and ninety nine? <laughs> Quick maths. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. On a Monday as well. I oh, know that's it. <laughs> a couple of coffees in before this one. Yeah, it's it's interesting, and you, I mean you would make the assumption that if you could have a more powerful experience with the 999 customers, they are more likely to spend a little bit more money or whatever it might be that would then make up for, and possibly mm. more the, the, the one customer of a thousand that, um, that couldn't, couldn't complete their purchase because the system was offline or whatever it might be. So interesting though, it's like when you say you, when you put it, um, when you when you talk about it like that, the customer in Antarctica versus the customer in Bond Street, you kind of think, okay, this is a bit of a no brainer. Yeah, um, uh, but I mean, it, it's a hard it's a hard one to sell. Let's say um, the the story with the penguins and and the sat link, it 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 does help the conversation, but it it's still it's still a big worry that that I see uh, across the retail industry is that offline. Because they're working to very small margins, it's if I if I miss the opportunity to to take five sales in a day, that's bad. Um, and and it's customer perception as well. It's if if a customer per perceives someone as having uh, tech problems, do you really want to spend your money there? You know, I I was in um I was in a card shop. Uh, buying something in there uh, a couple of weeks ago and their tills went down and the poor girl she said i'm gonna restart i need to restart the till it's not working and when it booted back up i could hear the windows 95 boot sound in the background <laughs> and i was holding onto my card and i was thinking i really want to use this till. you know as a as, as someone in tech like i'm pretty sure they were you know the the God knows when Windows ninety five went out of uh, out of service, but uh, there's definitely been a, a lot more a, a, a lot more security problems since then that it wouldn't have been countering for. Um, I won't name the company, um, but yeah, it's it's. 
I think that even that there are there that, that sort of tech problems that tech problems that businesses have are detrimental to sort of your customer's perception over whether or not this brand is is worth their salt. You know, if you go onto a website and the pictures don't load, I go, oh my god, what are they doing? Mm, yeah. But maybe that's just me because I work in tech. But now, as I said, everyone has um, everyone has a mobile phone. Everyone has an app for everything. We all perceive us as be ourselves as being um, experts at tech now because we're driven by mobile devices. So you know, whereas before, um, like my mum wouldn't want to touch a computer, she was like, "Oh no!" Um, now she's got her phone. She she does everything. Like she said, "Oh, I, you know, it does AI. It's great." Um, it's a complete change in paradigm for the world because now everybody feels they are techno literate when before maybe they weren't so much. If does that make sense? Yeah, no, definitely. I mean, you can do pretty much anything now in the palm of your hand, right? You yeah. can you can buy whatever product you want. You can like potentially even start a business using some of the AI tools or using your phone. There's, you can you can do pretty much everything with your phone something that you couldn't do 20 years ago for sure um just quickly going back to your point on the the, the till systems and what have you i mean um I, I guess the most important the most important fact from that is that if if you do have good customer loyalty for your brand then chances are that customer will return because they want to buy that product from your store however or, or from your website right but if you don't have the brand loyalty then mm -hmm. they're more likely just to pick up their phone and go and order it to get it delivered the next day, maybe even click and collect it the same day or just pop into a shop and, and get it. If it's something like a, a birthday card and you can get them For from sure. Sainsbury's, Moonpig, card, card Factory, whatever it might be. So, but yeah, I think from my opinion is if it was a brand that I really wanted to shop at because I like their clothing or whatever it might be, then I might wait. I might go back in half an hour or oh, yeah, sure. what have you. So, but, but anyway, for anyone that's interested in loyalty, just give you a quick plug that we've got talent, talent one joining the show either next or the episode afterwards. So make sure you stay tuned. Um, but going back to retail then, um, I've already touched upon the fact that in my opinion, it's one of the more forward thinking of, of, uh, industry sectors that, uh, that are, they're out there. Um, how, how do you feel retail sits versus some of the other industries? Um, retail is, is sort of, if we, we're talking retail apparel, shoes, fashion, um, it's, uh, it's fairly closed. So I I've worked in retail for the last 13, 14, 15 years, something like that. I keep losing track. Um, the enough. same people pop up. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So I've had dealings in the last couple of weeks with with uh, with people who are now CEOs of companies of, of large retailers who I used to work with in showrooms in Italy 10 years ago. So it is one of those businesses where um uh, if you excuse the, the word, it's quite incestuous. Like it's the same group of people moving about. Everyone knows everyone. I would say the change that I've seen is that there are those who are coming in, especially in the tech world, from non-retail companies like um, telecoms and and uh, and finance, who are now entering into the retail world because it's a little bit friendlier, in part. <laughs> but it tends to be that that we it retail is bringing in those uh those skills from from um from other verticals it's not that retail is spanning out do you know what i mean okay yeah so i've seen quite a lot of finance guys starting now in in fashion okay interesting it never used to happen um, no I mean, in fact, I've taken many a brief over the last fifteen years where we've been specifically asked to avoid places like finance and and what have you because it's generally seen as something that's slightly slower paced. Um, yeah, but the skills that have been accrued in those industries over the last kind of ten years, especially in data, are now really needed in retail. And there are certain things in retail like data which maybe haven't accelerated as quickly as you would ex you you would think. But they have in other industries, so that I think has been sort of one of the reasons why why uh, uh, you're seeing sort of people move from from um, from other types of business into retail. Yeah, and and that makes sense definitely. If there's another sector where they are uh, ahead of the curve in certain areas, like data, for example. I mean, I actually spoke to a chap not long ago, and uh, he said he specific he, he specifically ensures that he doesn't hire anyone within the sector that they operate in because he wants to bring outside mm -hmm. of the box thinkers in. So he's built a team around him of 
people from a variety of sectors and he absolutely swears by it and says that's how he's always going to going to operate because if you always if you're always hiring from within retail or from within travel mm. or whatever it might be then you're always going to have a similar thought process one of the things i see whenever i speak to somebody who has come in from from finance or from uh, even the travel agencies uh, the, i worked for a project manager who come from from uh, sta when they were still about um the, the one thing that they always say is that I can't believe how many projects I'm working on because whereas the other industries are relatively slow to, to evolve, retail is constantly evolving mm. because the customer does, the customer needs are changing and there's a big try and, and test and learn type culture. So whereas before they were working on a single project, multi-year project in retail, they may be working on four at a time because there are so many different initiatives going on. Yeah. And then that's it's partly why, I, yeah, that's why I see it as a forward thinking industry because they're, they're, it has to adapt to the customer's uh, demands, which as we've seen have changed substantially over the last 10 years, right? What sector do you believe is prime for the biggest change over the next five years? The, the one that I've seen uh, change in a big way is the energy companies. Um, energy companies have got a bad, name at the moment um you know we are very environmentally conscious uh you know they've, they've been dragged through the through the press um i was looking I, I don't use them but i was thinking about using them now that i saw it um octopus have started looking towards gamification and offering uh free hours worth of energy on social and things like that um i i use different company and they now have an app which is really useful for providing media readings and stuff like that. Um, and it's really friendly and it kind of got, I can't say like young um, in the way that it's pushing its marketing to you. Um, I think there's a massive change there because they have to do a lot of work to, to change the general perception of them. Yeah. Um, but I mean, I think generally across the board, as we said, gamification, loyalty, uh, being able to to present a, any business, being able to present themselves in a in a in a in a more sort of well connected manner, is going to be a differentiator. I, but energy, I think, is one where I, I think it's going to change in a big way. Okay. Okay. Do you do you feel as though um, the the gamification sort of trend is is still in its peak or if you if you were a business now and you didn't have a gamification type sort of loyalty slash reward program then you would be saying this is something that we need to do or do you feel as though we're kind of nearing the end of this phase and we're going to move on to something new in the next say sort of nine to twelve months um it's di definitely dying away a little bit as priorities change um I've, done, I've spoken to a lot of retailers who have said we tried gamification two three years ago we tried okay. it yeah and it didn't work out. The offering wasn't there. I think now that we have this more sort of um, omni-channel tech stack and and better marketing capabilities, it might come back. Okay. It might okay. come back. Um, and right. then, of course, there's AI. But there's a bigger conversation. <laughs> yeah. Well, do you know what? I, was, I imagine we might come on to that in a second because uh before we before we wrap things up we'll have a little bit of fun and i was going to ask you about some future predictions um that may or may not come true so mm. yeah i guess i guess here we go so how, i mean how do you see the next five years panning out how do i see the next five years uh i could ask chat gpt and see what it says <laughs> <laughs> I think everyone else actually... does right <laughs> That's one of those things. I've 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 seen I've seen that uh, uh, people are relying more on these large language models to be able to build up pieces of work and 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 and, and advice. Not us, um, but uh, that the, the the sort of the real world uses of AI. I'm really interested to see what happens and how that comes about. Um, and I think we spoke before. There is a, a f almost like this this inner battle between our need for, for privacy and data sharing, and then the large language model mode where you'll share everything under the sun to get a nice answer. Um, there is now, a, I've been told about, there's um, there's a, like an incognito mode now for, for OpenAI and ChatGPT where okay. you can ask it questions and it won't feed the model, which I think is great. Um, especially if you're, if you're utilizing it from a business perspective. Um, 
whenever we speak to a CTO, when I speak to a CTO, they always go on about AI. I really want AI. I want to do something with AI. But they can't sort of elaborate further than that. But they know that they need to be doing something because in their circles, they have heard that others are doing the same. Um, AI and, and ML, uh, we see it a lot in planning applications. So being able to better replenish stores because now you're in that full omni mode. The old uh, the old sort of algorithms and, and, and planning applications weren't able to to work out what happens when, say, your store is also a fulfillment center, for instance, or there is an event which happens. So suddenly um, uh, Glastonbury's on and everyone goes and buys tents and welly boots. But normally those products don't do well throughout the rest of the, the, the year. It's, it's that sort of conjoined thinking which you can't you you can't develop your own algorithm to do that that has to be ai driven interesting the incognito point i uh, i also wasn't aware of that yeah it's kind of ai develops its own knowledge and and, and skill from being fed into the the, the, the language model so Definitely. if everyone was to use it in incognito then surely it's going to limit its development right yeah um, I haven't tried it yet. I was told about it the other day, so I'll have a closer look. Um, maybe the maybe open AI, AI will put some form of um, of limit on use, using it. Yeah, um, you know, there I are. I, I come up with a lot of ideas. Um, none of them come to fruition because I don't have the time. But feeding some of those ideas, if they are novel enough, into a into um, a, a large language model. Um, it worries me a little bit that I'd be training an AI with some ideas which perhaps weren't out there already. There's not many that not many ideas, but there's not it's probably not many which are that novel. But it, it does. It, it, I think that's somewhere where where I particularly worry is around sort of intellectual property and and ideation, whether or not our reliance on AI will start to to hinder that because we're putting everything in the public domain yeah but likewise it does wonders for refining some ideas that you have and um and providing you uh with with at least a structure uh to work but yeah that, i mean you can use it for pretty much anything i know i know people that use it to help with with assignments and yeah. see, uh, I know people that have run business ideas through through uh chat gpt and all sorts, right? So, I mean, the opportunities that are endless, and sure. will, in my opinion, we're right at the the start of the the AI journey. I guess um, I'd be interested to know when you believe we will really unlock the power of of AI, I'm if ever, sure. if ever. Um, it, as a, I think, I think you've hit the nail on the head when you when you talk about the next five years. I think as we exit that five year period, we'll probably have a better idea on what works and what doesn't. Um, it's moving incredibly fast. Mm. So I wouldn't even be surprised if it's sooner than that. It's, okay. it's one of those areas where there seems to be something new every single month in, in regards to, to new use cases or enhancements on what's already out there. Uh, there's a lot of, 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 uh, um, of, uh, of, uh, of uh, movement there. The mobile phone industry, so like uh, Apple, Apple AI and 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 Google, I can't remember what they they call their one. Um, now there is like this move to fully integrate um, ChatGPT Chat, Chat, Chat and have a large language models directly into the palm of people's hands without them having to like go on the website or download an app. So that's going to change the way that 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 we work in a big way because, I mean, if we think when we were younger and mobile phones, they, they weren't really about, there were ways that we used to get information. There used to be a, a bunch of CDs that, that held an encyclopedia. We had books on a shelf. We got access to the internet. Then we got mobile phones and everything's in the palm of our hand. Then we got AI, which was very much based on a desktop of an app we downloaded. Now it's going to be embedded into the technology we use every single day. And it's going to change the way that we that we look for information again. Mm. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Big shift. I didn't, I didn't think about that, but it's, it's crazy. Literally, it, it had everything in the palm of your hand. It just mm -hmm. goes back to the capabilities of mobiles and just how uh, how much of an impact they've had in absolutely everything. Yep. Um, 
Cool. Okay. Well, last question from me then before we wrap things up. And that is, um, how does the high street look in the next five years? Retail has obviously gone through a lot of change over over the last 10 years, but particularly mm. obviously over the COVID period. Um, but yeah, in your opinion, how, how will the, the high street look in the next five years? Um, it's going to exist. Uh, there's a lot of doomsayers saying, oh, no, everything's going online and things are closing down. I think the way that people see physical retail space will change. It is much more around merchandising of a product opposed to the the end game to sell something. So uh, not so much in in sort of apparel and and that area, but like um, there's this there's a move now that um, that that shops are more showrooms rather than rather than shops. Mm. They're the ability for a customer to engage with a product to touch it. They might not necessarily finish the journey there. Um, we'll see a lot of clients who will go into a store, have a look at something, and then order it to be shipped to their house, even clothes. Because, you know, unless there's a necessity to have it there and then and try it on in the next two seconds, um, so, or take it home and, and have it that evening, you know, it, it's very, very easy now to to um to make an endless aisle order and have it shipped directly to a house so i think stores are going to change in in their usage um we've already seen a move where uh there's a lot of demand to move physical point of sales and and desks away and to put mobile point of sales and so staff are walking around engaging with clients and then they're able to serve them directly there with a with an iphone or android um mpos uh, and that has two effects. It's it's to put them back into uh, conversations directly with the client while they're walking around the store, but also it opens up a large amount of space in the store for merchandising, to put more product, to put signage or um, other sort of uh, uh, other things which will um, enhance the, the the shop floor to make it a more inviting place to be. Because if you think of desks and old point of sale place, um, uh areas they do take up a lot of physical space yeah is now it's not really necessary when you can get this you know 50 times the computing power in the palm of your hand rather than relying on an old uh, uh desktop machine yeah no i guess it also prevents queuing right because if you've got five different yeah. um staff each with a of an ipad or tablet then you've got five different areas to sell rather than just one with, with exactly. maybe one or two members of staff that are selling. So yeah, I, I know I, I mean, I shopped in shoe. This was going back two or three years ago and they, they had tablets then. And I found that was really cool. And it, I, I looked at it and I thought, why, why don't more companies do this? Because mm. it, it made my experience better. You even had a card machine in the back that you could put your card in or contactless. And it was just really simple, it just made sense. Um, so where but- industry is, is great for that because you're, you're you're asking for especially when it's like the 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 um uh left shoe concept where you have like one shoe available and you ask for the other one then you try it on and then they put it in a box and they take it behind the till and then you go queue at the till and wait to pay for your goods if they could do everything directly in front of the the wall of shoes and you could walk straight out of it it just make life so much easier it makes sense i don't yeah i don't know why uh, more businesses don't do it so i'm sure it, I'm sure it can't be too hard particularly with the technology we have available these days um cool well i think uh you know probably brings an end to the show simon so um thank you for joining me it's been a pleasure um i hope everyone has enjoyed the, the session today um lots of interesting uh insights into into technology where it, where it was 10 years ago where it is now, where it's headed. Obviously, a big focus on loyalty, brand, uh, sorry, brand loyalty, gamification, and those areas. So, uh, if you are a business and you you haven't got a focus in that point, then um, it's certainly worth looking into and, and possibly even speaking to Simon directly to see uh, to get some more specific insights um, versus um, to get some more specific insights specifically for your brand. Um, but look, I hope you've all enjoyed it, and I will see you again soon. Thank you. Thank you.